Welcome to this webinar on sorting through alternative writing, alternative pencils. During this webinar, we'll be taking a closer look at alternative pencils, including methods of access to tablets and computers. We're going to take a look at alternative pencils, alternative pencil features based upon input processing and output. We'll give lots of examples, including videos, and also leave you with some resources to follow up. My name is Kelly Bonner. I do training and consulting in educational and assistive technologies. My background is as a special education teacher with training in rehabilitative and special education technologies. And I'd like to thank my colleagues for always sharing their information with me so that I can share it with you. There are all kinds of alternative pencils from handheld keyboards to adjustments to the pencil or pen that you're using, on-screen keyboards, enlarged keyboards, keyboards operated by your eyes, and also keyboards that are accessible to individuals such as partner-assisted scanning and eye linking. So who are the people that use alternative pencils? Well, it's a large group of people that struggle with the inability to hold the traditional writing tools. Um, it might be sensory reasons, there might be vision reasons, there might be multiple impairment reasons, onset of disability, um, the aging population, people who have dysgraphia, people that have illegible handwriting for multiple reasons. And we look at tools everywhere from things to do to adjust to the pencil and the paper, to giving alternative keyboards, as well as having um, keyboards accessible with your eyes. Different types of alternative keyboards include pencil grips, alphabet displays that are accessible to people via their fingers and toes and handheld pointers, eye gaze systems, partner assisted scanning strategies. We have other low tech tools like keyboards that are made to just be an electronic keyboard, um, label writers that print things out so you can stick them onto forms and worksheets, um, and the other things that go directly onto a keyboard itself, such as key guards and key caps. Key caps are those in large letters that go on your keyboard. We'll also take a look at high tech alternatives, uh, miniaturized keyboards and large keyboards, looking at keyboards that are designed ergonomically or cordic keyboards, so less keys you cord to create letters, um, keyboards that are accessible through coding, um, using augmentative and alternative communication systems as keyboards as a strategy and alternative pencils. And then looking at on-screen keyboards that are accessible with your hand, um, through eye typing. There are people that will use switch activated keyboards based upon positioning of their tongue onto a key plate, a joystick, or a head array, sometimes with the same controllers that a person drives their power chair can also be set up to drive the cursor around a screen and around a keyboard. And of course, all the various methods of switch scanning. So we have a lot to get through. Feature matching is a part of the fundamental assessment process. After you've gotten your background information, looked at individual skills, as you're trying to make some decisions about which of these alternative pencils to try out, you want to match up that individual's skills and the needs and expectations of what they need to do with an alternative pencil before you start to make some decisions about what you're going to try. So that's all about that feature matching process. And we break tools down into input features, that human interaction with the technology, with processing, which is that cognitive interaction. And here in the case of alternative pencils, the processing features have a lot to do with the layout. How is the alphabet presented? How are the other functions of the keyboard presented to an individual? What does somebody get as a, a result of using their method? You know, they're going to get print output. What kind of print output? And of course, all those other human factor features that make a difference whether or not somebody's going to use the alternative pencil. So when we look at feature matching, 
for individuals, we look at that writer and the properties of what that writer brings to the table. What are their strengths in their areas of the senses, cognition, language, and motor that's gonna impact writing? What are the needs about how they use technology and what, what kinds of supports they need from technology? And what are the expectations and their priorities for writing tasks throughout the day? This is gonna impact your decisions about technology. Somebody's abilities and needs are gonna impact their input method, that human technology interface. Processing, you know, their cognition, their senses, all of this is gonna go into what the layout looks like and what are the different rate enhancements like word prediction that you might use. What do you get as a result? What do they need to do? Do they need to produce letter by letter writing? Do they need to have whole word writing? Do they need to produce sentences? And all of the different formats that we produce writing. Letters, notes, print, drawings, and of course, what are the human factors? We've given you some access to more robust feature match forms that you can take a look at in each of these four areas. And all of that leads up to, as you're listening to the more specifics about alternative pencils, think about the features that your client, your student, your own child needs so that you can put those at the top of the column of a feature match form. And then the tools that you might be interested in, the supports, the adjustments that you might be interested in, go down that first column so that in a true feature match way, you can look at a feature and look at each product and see whether it has that feature or not. Looking a little bit more closely at input features, we look at access method. Is it a direct selection access method? As you see some examples here, where people are directly typing on keyboards or using swipe commands to move across keyboards more quickly. They might be using an alternative stylus that's held in their mouth. They might be using a head array to move around an on-screen keyboard. What some of the other things that we look at for input is what are the size of the keys? What are the size of those cells? How are they grouped together? Is color used in any way to help clue people in on maybe where vowels are versus where consonants are? For the pressure of the keyboard that they're using, how much pressure do they have to stress upon the keys? How much movement do they have before another key is tight? So other kinds of things that can help for positioning. Are there tactile markers, bumps, and other kinds of markers around the screen to let somebody know where the keys may be so that it can be more successful with touch typing and not have to watch everything as they type? There might be other kinds of ways and low-tech ways of doing this when we're using paper and handheld writing implements to mark off and designate the area that needs to be written in. And other factors of timing, if keys are gonna be presented through scanning in any form, how quickly will that scan move? Will that scan have auditory feedback? We're gonna show you some more of these within examples of particular products and some videos. As I mentioned, the processing has to do with layout. And there are lots of different layouts. It's not just the QWERTY layout that is around. And QWERTY is that Q-W-E-R-T-Y, those letters most frequently laid out on standard laptops and desktops. And now we have them as the standard within on-screen keyboards on our tablets. But that doesn't mean that they are the most efficient keyboard for everyone. Some people, based upon cognition and experience and access to prior keyboard use, might prefer an alphabetical arrangement. They might prefer some of these al alphabetical arrangements that are grouped for various motor planning and visual access reasons. You'll see some examples on the screen here of different layouts that have to do with frequency of occurrence so that the most frequently used letters might be underneath your home row of keys or might be right where within your pattern of moving across a miniature keyboard or might be within your movement pattern if you're using a head stick or if you're using an eye gaze system or if you're using scanning. So taking a look at these different layouts for frequency should be a part of your assessment process. And we've given you a handout on um, frequency layouts. 
We'll also look at this idea of scribing, where you have a partner that you are scribing to, whether you're doing that by voice dictation, whether you're scribing by eye pointing, so you're eye pointing to the letters that you want somebody to write down for you, that you might be doing some type of partner assisted scanning, where an individual is pointing to the rows and columns, pointing to the individual letters, and you're making your selections. And whether or not those are presented auditorily or just visually, often have to do with the amount of functional vision that the client has that you're working with. You'll also see these layouts based upon the frequency of order. It might be letter by letter that's being announced. It could be that those letters are grouped in a variety of patterns, whether it's frequency by the first letter, whether the alphabet is put in a number of rows, broken in half. So you'll see some of those examples in future slides. What do we get as a result? So that output, it's a pretty concrete piece in the writing process. I have things presented visually to me, so whether they're gonna remain in a visual format so that I can interface with other technologies such as social media, projecting it, you know, giving presentations from what you've written. Um, what's the contrast at what you're looking at? Does it need to be magnified? Do you need to have speech to text so that what you've spoken is produced to text in front of you? Do you need to have that text read out loud? So having text to speech um, and having voice typing, those kinds of things that have been auditorily recorded, as well as looking at tactile feedback. And other human factors that impact our use of all types of assistive technology is the universal design, the transparency of use of a product, that operating system, whether it's in the operating system that's at your workplace or at school or in your home, or if you're having to learn a totally new operating system just because of the assistive technology doesn't always make a good match for people. And then those real human pieces. What color is it? What size is it? How do I get it from place to place? How do I turn things on? Do I need assistance with that? And in the process of trials, are there loaners? Are there a way to take my money that I've put into renting into a purchase of some of the more higher price ticket items? And so also looking at the kinds of company support and training that is available for each of the tools you're may be choosing from. So let's look here at some examples more specifically. All the way from some of the traditional things that we do to writing tools, such as using grips and grasps, so that that can help with pencil pressure, so that it can help with coordination with it. And we also look at things like head sticks and mouth wands, that you can put markers and pencils in so that so that people can draw with that. Some other kinds of supports that are out there, I mean, it doesn't seem like alternative pencils, but so often people need to have a model and that model needs more to be more close to them. So here's some examples from really good stuff of models that can be put right onto a desk or onto a notebook and carried around. If you're using a handheld tool, it's helpful to have different types of paper supports, whether it's a template that you can put over top of the paper, whether it's adaptive paper based upon the color or raised lines, that can be very helpful. You can also look at making those kinds of papers yourself. As a classroom teacher with a low amount of money for resources, we used to take puffy paint and put it over the lines so that we had raised line paper for our students who were learning to stay within lines or needed to have those guides for visual purposes. Well, we would use puffy paint or we would also go over it with a tracing wheel from a fabric tracing wheel. Um, some people need to write and have it enlarged. And if they're using a handheld way of writing, then they can use and write underneath their CCTV. So using that closed circuit television to enlarge what it is that you're writing um, right in front of you. Um, and also things like using visuals to indicate where it is to write. So every other line is something that can be done to paper or made that way. Some other supports we do to the physical act of writing is slanting the surface. This can be done with slant boards, binders, um, making sure that things are stabilized is another way to support someone who wants to and is writing on physical paper. 
And if you need support with handwriting, we wanted to make sure we added some of this information into um, programs like the Handwriting Without Tears and others that are both in print and also electronic. There is a website called typingtraining.com produced by an occupational therapist, Bridget Nicholson. And one of the things that Bridget has is typing training activities also set up for assessment for assistive technologies. So taking a look at the advantages of using voice, recording, text-to-speech, or using handwriting, or using typing with the various things like word prediction and other rate enhancements. You can also start to look at that idea of alternatives by having physical alternatives that go on to paper. So things like using a stencil to draw your letter with it and using a stamp to stamp on it or a bingo dauber to mark a report or a test. Using different kinds of label writers um, is another way of looking at that technology. So having uh, print label writers that go right on. Um, cookie sheet magnets. You have, if you're doing anything with letters in kind of a more instructional activity where letters need to be moved around quite quickly, you can be using magnets, you can be using letter tiles or letter cards. It doesn't always have to be that somebody's printing during these kinds of activities because their energy needs to go to the cognition of the activity, not to the cognition of how do I write the letter D. When you're looking at tablets, iPads, Galaxy tablets, whatever it may be, sometimes it's helpful for people to use a stylus. Um, if their hand lays upon the touch sensitive screen, sometimes it's not as easy to get the specific item that you want to activate. So you'll see different kinds of stylus for writing and styluses for choosing. Um, and you've got some links here some, to some examples. There's a nice review on YouTube from the average tech guy as he goes through the, the current Apple pencils that are available. Then we start looking at even more types of alternatives where we swap out the standard keyboard with an alternative keyboard that may be a larger keyboard, maybe one that has colors to help guide, if the colors might be there for visual purposes, and also alternative keyboards such as Braille writers. So there are low-tech Braille writers, as you see in this image, and high-tech Braille writers, as you see here. So let's give you um, a video of showing you that it really is never too early to start writing that we look at using these types of alternative writing tools in the same way that very young children who can pick up crayons and markers start to scribble. We want to scribble with the tools of our writing future. So this first video is Ethan. Ethan is blind. He's one year old. Um, and his mother and brother are with him as he's exploring this Mountbatten Brailler. Can you show somebody the door? Yeah. A little bit. You're doing good, Ethan. Let me know yeah. when you're I can done, go no. So I'm he's feeling the braille. Just oh. like when we write with pencils and pens and we can see what it is that we're writing. Okay. This is what Ethan is exploring. Typing with the keys on the braille writer, in this case the Mountbatten brailler and then feeling the results of it. These are the ways that we explore the tools of our writing future. And then first grader, this is not the same boy, showing his abilities to use his Mountbatten Brailler in his first grade classroom. Hi, my name is Mason. From physical alternative keyboards, we also look at keyboards that are on the screen. You know, based upon your operating system, like an iPad or some type of a tablet, you may already have a keyboard on the screen. But how accessible it is to somebody, there may need to be an alternative. And you see some examples here um, on this slide. Everywhere from keys that are have more color to them, that are enlarged, keys that have word prediction as a part of the keyboard, um, keys that are arranged 
such as the super keys in the lower right hand corner that are grouped. And so when I select one of those items, then it will enlarge that whole group so that I don't have to have quite as much preciseness on the first selection. And then the next selection will only have six to seven items on the screen for me to choose from. And then of course we have individuals that have communication boards and communication devices. And often those devices have an alphabet within them or a page um, in some communication books that are, are an alphabet as a way of using those as a writing strategy for expressive communication, but they can also be used as a writing supplement. So you'll see that within different AAC systems like the Smartbox Grid, uh, the PRC Essence, uh, Word Power. I mean, there's a lot of products that have the alphabet within them. And so making sure that you're using all the resources that your client has is an important thing to do. If you are going to use strategies that produce whole words, like using keyboards and word prediction, you might want to, depending upon the activity, have some kind of a writing production key so that the people who are the recipients of that student's writing or that individual's writing know how it was produced. This happens mostly in school settings as kids are learning to write. And this is an example from my colleague, Kristen Gray, as she works with young people and getting them to author more information. And so when we, she has a particular client that um, sends surveys and emails to us. And when he sends those emails and surveys to us, um, we can see how he's produced his words, whether it was something that he chose right from his communication system, whether it was something that he said by voice, um, or if it was something that was added by the person who was scribing for. So now, what about those people who can't physically write? You know, we've looked at everywhere from adapting pencils to alternate keyboards, using communication devices, but all the things that we've covered so far are about touch. Um, so voice, what about people who can use their voice? This idea of dictation um, in a low tech way, Somebody makes a picture or somebody sees a photograph and they, by voice, tell somebody what it is and that person scribes it down for them. But what about also recording your voice? There are a variety of products that have voice recording. And so I can have a recorded message that goes along with something that I've written or in place of, of writing, I use a sound recording. You can also use voice typing. So whether or not you call it voice recognition or voice typing, here's an example of um, where it's built in. My colleague, Mike Murata, has examples of how it's built into the Google tools. But the thing to always be thinking of is this whole cycle that somebody that's using their voice to type goes through. It might not be just because somebody has the voice to speak with, that it's going to be their most productive way of getting print on the page. Because you go through that cycle of having to think, compose, talk, read what it's then put onto the screen, check to make sure that's correct, and then edit it if it's not. And then you're right back in that cycle of talking the next sentence or the next paragraph based upon the, the individual tool that you're using, how much you talk at one time. So it might not always be as simple as it seems, and it can be made less complex with a lot of the other strategies that we use to help people writing on a blank page. Sentence starters, word banks, those types of things can help the voice typer as well. And we have eye typers. So people that are using either their augmentative and alternative communication system that they type by their eyes, or their whole purpose of having an eye gaze system is so that they can write and access the internet and all of the things that they would like to do on social media. Um, and you'll see in a variety of products is one example of a screen from the Toby series running a grid pod um, layout, which is a grouped alphabet layout. You'll see products like the Mega B in the lower right, 
which is a product that is just about spelling by location. So as a person is spelling, the person that is their partner is tapping in the letters that they have chosen, and that comes across the bottom screen. So you'll get some other examples with eye gaze. You can go to this article on the screen that we have from Practical AAC and take a look at different eye gaze systems. There are you know, many people working on eye gaze. Um, this is one example from of a, what's called the eye gaze curve from Call Scotland and looks at some of the products that help train people to use eye gaze. So there are a lot of games, look to learn, those kinds of things where you use your eye gaze to look around and starting to control the screen. But the thing to understand about using your eyes to type is that the game playing is not always the same skills with your eyes as typing with your eyes because you also have that piece of I have to know what it is that I'm going to type and I'm going to want to write that and can I use word prediction and some of those movements are not relative to the games and so I mean game playing is fine but recognize that it might not always lead you to do typing the best way to do anything is to start out writing with your eyes and just start through the same writing process as somebody who is handheld has done it. And so non-electronic eye typing um, are ways in which we have an alphabet array that a consumer can choose from with their eyes and then somebody writes that down. So you'll see these different kinds of encoded alphabets where they're grouped. The first look is to the group. The second look is to the color of the item in the group. So for example, for this uh, cartoon image that's at the top, if I was to type the word the, I'm looking over to the right-hand side where I see the group with QRST. And then I'm gonna look to orange because the T is in an orange background. I'm gonna type the word H by looking up to the group that's up in the middle. My partner will confirm this group. And then color, again, I look at orange, and then they will look back to that group and say H. Sometimes people are writing things down as um, you are typing, I typing them in. There are some of these systems have particular names because of who they were created for or by. We're gonna take a look at a quick video from, from some of these. Um, so the Vocalize Becker um, is an eye gaze system that was created for Jason Becker. And I'm going to show you a video of how that one works. Um, so it's grouped by four. So that's still two part look encoded. And then the eye link system, which works in a different strategy of having a transparency of the alphabet between yourself and a client and you move, the partner moves that system around until your eyes are linking one another through that letter. So we have two examples from YouTube here. I'm just gonna show little parts of them and then you can go back and watch the full video. First, let's take a look at Jason. Jason uses this system both to talk and write. And I wanted the simplest, quickest method possible. So. I took basically a grid of six squares, took the alphabet, put four letters in each square, that's 24, two letters left over, Y and Z down here in the corner. So every letter of the alphabet has two eye movements. The first eye movement takes you to the square, the second eye movement takes you to the letter in the square. Are you ready? A. There is the square, I'm sorry, there's the square. There's the letters, so that is D. There's the square. There's the letter, that is O. There's the square. There's the letter G. He just said D, O, G, that is dog. Now let's take a look at the iLink system. Here today with Anetta to show how to utilize our eTran slash iLink low-tech communication board. Hi, my name is Anetta. 
I will demonstrate how to use the low-tech board. It's wise to learn to use the low-tech in case of power outages and when the high-tech is not available like when transferring and during the bed bath. Um, Annetta will be spelling something for me and I I'm going to move the board to link my eyes with hers and then we will be able to identify which letter she's after and she will give me a blink for a yes and she will look straight ahead if that's a no. So go ahead, Annetta. H E A D I N G head falling. So this idea of alternative pencils was developed in a low tech way with uh, Dr. Gretchen Hanser, who's an occupational therapist that worked at the Center for Literacy and Disability Studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, you'll see an article link there to writing to alternative pencils, which will also link you to Project Core that has 20 or so different layouts for alternative pencils. And you're gonna see a couple of them used in some videos here in the next slides. So here's an example of a alternative pencil that's included in a child's communication system. Um, her communication system is a pod book. Um, in this particular example, Zoe had never been introduced to her alphabet yet. Um, and the rest of the students in her class were writing. And so we wanted to make sure that she was able to do the same activity and introduce the alphabet to her. Zoe has cortical vision impairment. So you'll see our use of the light is to make sure that she's looking across all of them, as well as to help scan the groups for her. Look back here. We're just gonna look, look, look. These are ABCs. Those are all the alphabet. They're all back here. All the facts. And if I go here, I get to turn a page, ah, and they're bigger. B. So we had yet developed the consistent selection method, and so what we're doing is selecting anything that she's doing that seems intentional. So whether she claps, whether she puts her hands up in the air, whether she takes her breath in to say yes. So all of these ways are ways in which she's selecting the group and the letter. Flip books are another way in which we um, scan the alphabet. And so you might have, you'll see different layouts for these, whether they're all on one page or whether they're um, each line or each row is on its own page so that I might scan through A, B, C, D wait for a select or non-select indicator and go through it. Depending upon how much vision somebody has is whether or not I'm reading out the letters to them. And then as you see in the picture above, then you're just writing down whatever letters people choose. And if you are doing some word prediction um, for them. It's always good to include in the flip book some, you know, making a space, ending punctuation, um, telling people that you're finished writing or that you have another idea. These things can be included on the very last section of the flip book or on the side like you're gonna see in this example. So this is an alternative pencil for auditory plus visual scanners um, developed by Linda Burkhart. And you'll see this example off of um, the We Speak Pod YouTube and Facebook page um, as they're doing some of their writing in homeschool. Angela, I have something to say. I'm telling you something. Yep, it's about now. School activities. 
Oh, mommy's looking upside down. School activities, turn the page. We're gonna do some writing, some really special activity writing. Yes, you are ready. A, B, C, D, E. Head's not moving. No. F, G, H, I, J. Thinking? Yes. F. G. I see your little yes. Can I have a big yes, please? Yes. G. Did you make a mistake? No. Do you have another letter? One of the things that you see with these methods of partner-assisted scanning is the consistency in which the scan is delivered by the partner and that the partner's trying not to interfere with the writing process by adding too much verbal so that the individual that they're working with and that they're writing for that it's about what they want to write, not influenced by the person who's scanning for them. Another example can be found um, from this student that is making um, a card. Can you help me write now? Can you help me write? I'm going to have you choose some letters and I'll write them down so we can make a card for Mrs. Lemons. Do you choose any of these letters? A, B, C, or D? D? Did we choose D? Did we choose D? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to write the letter D. And again, you can watch more D? of that video on YouTube. Here's another example of how we might use voice as a selection method, you've seen um, kids using their hands, using a nod, but also using your voice. I got something fun we're gonna try today. And we're gonna write a story about the pumpkin patch. You went to the pumpkin patch today, didn't you? At the farm? And would you like to write some words about it? Yeah, I saw a blink. Yes, okay, let's do. Look, I have some letters on this page. Do you see my letters? Here's the letter A, B, C, and D. Would you like for me to write one of those words for you? You want to choose one of those letters, I meant? Or you want to turn the page and find a different letter? Would you like the letter A? Do you want me to write A? No. You want to write a B? Yes. So lastly here, we'll touch on switch access to alternative keyboards as alternative pencils. So the electronic form of partner-assisted scanning, where the technology moves the scan array from letter to letter, either by groups or rows and columns. Um, make sure that you're doing a full switch evaluation to determine what type of switch and location of switch. Um, that it isn't just about using your hands at midline, but that we can look at heads and feet and also look at non-electronic switches that might be easier and more reliable than some of the mechanical switches. But the other thing to take a look at is the scanning array. Make sure that you have a backup strategy because like eye gaze, switch access can be tiring. And so when somebody is learning to use their switches, or we're in the beginning of the day or the ending of the day, people need, might need to have another type of access method. So I'm gonna give you a video um, from the assistive wear company from a woman with ALS, Marie Claire, and how she uses her scanning array. And when you, people say that switch access is slow, I want you to think about this video in the future. Nowadays, the computer has become an almost indispensable tool. I am in front of my computer, and manage the bank accounts as well as my mail. 
What is more, I do all kinds of shopping, groceries, clothes, Christmas presents, just about anything. And all of that from home, without the need to go out. As I am almost completely paralyzed and my hands do not move at all, it is impossible for me to type on a keyboard or use a mouse. Therefore, I use a scanning program called Switch XS. This allows me, through the aid of a switch, to control the scanning of one or more keyboards designed by myself. The switch is a little device that is taped to my cheek. All I need to do is make small jaw movements to activate the scanning. So that's a woman who has created her own scan array um, because it was more efficient for her to type that way in her language. So with that, let's put it back on your plate. What are you going to do next about feature matching in your setting? My suggestion is always to go through that process with a client of what are the features that they need, what are the possible tools that can lead you to your trials. You can get some assistance with assessment from websites such as the WADI, the Wisconsin Assistive Technology Initiative, and their assessment modules on writing and computer access. The Denise DeCoast Writing Protocol will do a comparative of individual handwriting, of their typing, and of their keyboard tasks that they do. You can use it with a variety of the keyboards that you try to see which might be more efficient. It also looks at um, their spelling abilities and what kinds of supports might be needed based upon their ability to spell. Tools in the area of learning media assessments for individuals with vision impairments can be helpful in looking through what the writing tools may be um, and even looking at specific tools for Braille, um, like this one, the ABLES for Braille and taking a look at use of Braille in literacy tasks, emergent literacy, and in academic literacy. There's also a developmental writing scale that's research-based from Dr. Janet Sturm and her colleagues that looks at the use of writing as it's very developing from just choosing an idea to writing three cohesive paragraphs. And you can find out more about that from um, the link here from the Don Johnston Company. Other resources for you to use to do searches on these types of tools are at the techmatrix.org and at the Closing the Gap Resource Directory. And don't forget to share the responsibilities. Looking at the list of things that need to be done, who may be responsible, having a person that's first and a person that's a backup is critical to be able to follow through in the assessment and implementation process. And with that, we have worked our way through alternative pencils and some computer access supports as well. Thank you for your attention and time. Thank you for watching this webinar. For more information on the ATP Education Program, please visit our website at atp.nebraska.gov or email us at atp.education at nebraska.gov.